Hello students, welcome to study IQ. In this session, we are going to talk about the period between 1793 to 1805. Okay, so in the previous session, we have discussed about uh, Lord Cornwallis from 1786 to 1793. So this period we have already covered in the previous session. So there we have actually talked about civil service reforms police reforms right judicial reform and when we discussed about judicial reform or Cornwallis code we have discussed about the changes which we have introduced in the structure and the law right and we have covered that in detail and I've told you the possible main questions mains questions and we have also seen the way of answering those questions also okay so I've told you so he introduced certain concepts like rule of law equality before law etc and even now also if you see the constitution these are the most important pillars of our constitution or our constitution is actually built on these two most important pillars right rule of law equality before law etc so that's about uh, Cornwallis and when we discussed about Cornwallis towards the end we have discussed about in 1793 he introduced permanent settlement right so this is related to land tenure system or land revenue settlement so permanent settlement that he introduced in 1793 which was based on you know a base year right 1790 was the base year so the land revenue is actually fixed on the basis of a base year and base price so 1790 is the base year so land revenue is fixed by the state on the basis of this base year 1790 so whatever you are paying in 1790 that will be fixed for 93 94 95 so it won't change okay now if you remember when we discussed about lord warren hastings this period 1773 to 1785 this period he also tried to do certain uh, land revenue settlements and we have discussed about five year settlement one year settlement and in fact we have discussed the main question why lord warren hastings period in history is known as trial and error period we have seen how to answer this we have seen how to support warren hastings and how to criticize warren hastings also so there uh, we have discussed about the uh, system that he introduced but everything was left to the zamindars over there even the zamindars will decide how much to pay to state right so there was a bidding process there was an auction process in that bidding process whoever caught the maximum amount and state will give the zamindarship to that person and those zamindars who get the zamindarship they never was able to realize that money and state cannot implement any policies so this was actually the failure the problem with that policy is actually you are leaving everything to zamindar but here state is actually fixing how much you need to collect so on the basis of 1790 so that problem is solved that's why it is permanent settlement it is settled for you know in the it is set, settled permanently on the basis of the base year exactly the same as what you're going to pay so it looks like the peasants will benefit right because it is settled for uh, you know on the base of 1790 but every year production keeps on increasing so still you need to pay the same tax but actually peasant won't get this benefit some other section will get the benefit we will see how is it actually going to happen okay and we have seen that also so when we discuss about permanent settlement uh, we have discussed about uh, who implemented this lord cornwallis along with him john shore john shore was the deputy so lord cornwallis and john shore was the people who were behind permanent settlement where it was implemented it was implemented in bengal bihar Orissa, parts of Tamil Nadu and parts of Benares okay so it was mainly in the eastern part of India when we talk about Ryotwari settlement it will be in the southern part and central part of India when we talk about Mahalwari settlement it will be in the northern part of India like Punjab and western UP etc okay uh, so let's say how much area of British India is covered under permanent settlement 19 percentage of British India is covered under permanent settlement so when we talk about Ryotwari settlement I'll tell you that's a maximum 51% and Mahalwari settlement that is 30% so we will discuss accordingly when the corresponding governor general for example it was under the time of Thomas Munro and Reed the Mahalwari settle uh, the Ryotwari settlement and when we discuss about uh, Mahalwari settlement uh, Halt Mackenzie is the person who implemented so during or what I'll do is I'll discuss those two also along with this so that area anyway will get completed so there there is no need to keep this for uh, you know later so we will discuss about Ryotwari and Mahalwari now and then we will discuss about rest of this period so even though I've given 1793 to 1805 I am not basically interested in discussing this period 1793 to 1798 
because this was the period of Lord, uh, you know, John Shaw, and nothing much actually happened during this time from the perspective or the from the point of view of exam. See, if you see my classes, it's only you know to the exam point. It is precise crisp and there is nothing more nothing less we are only talking from exam point of view we are not wasting any single minute there is nothing junk i am talking here so it may be boring but i am not here to you know uh, talk uh, or make history interesting i am explaining the contents whatever is required from exam point of view so i am making my stand and my point clear i am not here to waste my time also i am sitting in front of the camera maximum 30 minutes i'll record and i'm I am okay with it. So there is no point in you know extending or unnecessarily waste of time. I can t talk about history for hours. Okay. And history is a subject which is so vast and whatever you want you can talk. But I am purposely skipping John Shaw because he is not important from exam point of view. John Shaw question if it is coming. It will come as you know a permanent settlement because he was that he was the person who was assisting Lord Cornwallis in implementing the permanent settlement. Only in that context you might have heard that name. Apart from that, this name is not so significant or important in the history of India. Okay, so we are not concerned about that from exam point of view. I am discussing only from exam point of view, keeping in mind. Okay, so then we will discuss about the 1798 to 1805 okay here i will discuss one of the controversial person lord wellesley and we will discuss this controversial policy subsidiary alliance many times asked in exam so i'll teach you what you mean by subsidiary alliance who is actually the pioneer of this policy is it lord uh, wellesley or someone else we will discuss that that also was asked as a question and then we will discuss what are the states which are signed subsidiary alliance what were the conditions under this and we will see different other dimensions also of subsidiary lens that is very important so that we will discuss in detail okay so in this session i am basically going for a quick recap of this permanent settlement that we have almost done then rotwari and mahalwari anyway i'll complete here itself there is no need to keep it for future and then um, uh, we will skip john show and we will move to lord wellesley there i'll discuss about subsidiary lens that's it now i have almost done all the history videos and this is almost like uh, the cycle is repeating so if you want to complete the videos all those videos are available most of the videos are available in the telegram channel this is my telegram channel zia safir okay so my name is safir zia safir that the telegram channel you can get my videos over there or this is my instagram id you can get in touch with me here or this is my facebook id okay so the facebook page is uh, zia ia so you can get in touch with me in any of this if you want to write a test series with me mains uh, especially sociology or gs or ethics or in general after the prelims if you wish to write a test series with me you can contact me this is my number 9790892697989557775 so for my personal mentorship program for civil services guidance it's all about and you know uh, if you want to write the test series any help related to civil services you can get in touch with me okay so let's get started with today's session so we are talking about permanent settlement 1790s price 19 percentage of the area who implemented lord Cornwallis? where bengal bihar oriza parts of tamil nadu and banaras what is the structure structure is like this zamindar will collect the tax from the person and will pay it to the state now who is the owner between zamindar and person between peasant and zamindar zamindar is the owner so zamindar can evict the peasant anytime if the peasant is not able to pay the tax similarly when it comes to state and zamindar this ownership of zamindar is not absolute it is between peasant and zamindar when it comes to zamindar and state who's the owner zamindar versus state state is the owner that means the state can evict the zamindar if the zamindar is not able to pay the tax in time okay so that's about uh, the concept of ownership and you know uh, there was a law passed in 1794 known as sunset law so under sunset law if the zamindar is not able to pay the tax upon the you know uh, the time which is fixed there will be a time period which will be fixed before the sunset if the zamindar is unable to or not able to pay the zamindar will be evicted and will be given to the another zamindar okay so that's about the structure so i hope you understood who implemented we have discussed convertis and john shore where bengal bihar orissa parts of tamil nadu banaras and when 1793 it was implemented on the base of base year price and ownership we have discussed sunset law we have discussed yeah now why zamindar is working zamindar who will what he will get zamindar will get a share of 1 by 11 state will be getting a share of 
10 by 11 out of the collected revenue so that means if you put it in percentage there's going to be 9 percentage and there's going to be 91 percentage so basically zamindars are working for this 9 percent now understand when uh, this system was introduced Zamindars are no more going to enjoy the power of policing unlike before. Before Zamindars used to enjoy the power of policing also but now police reforms I have already discussed. So police stations were established, police officials were appointed so no such powers are there. So that's about the permanent settlement. Now if you look into the impact of this, the consequences, the two most important consequences that you need to write here is, you see here if the zamindar is evicted under sunset law a new zamindar will come the new zamindar may come uh, with or by looking into that nine percent commission he may be a businessman he may be an urban merchant he might not be knowing anything related to this land or land peasants or land relations land equations etc so he is just looking for that commission and he take up this contract okay so that lead to a situation of absentee landlordism he may not present there in the land actually so the first important consequence that you cannot afford to miss if the question is about permanent settlement that is absentee landlordism absentee landlordism second one see this uh, zamindar who took the contract he may, may not have time so he will appoint another person like zamindar 2 to collect this so by saying that out of the nine i'll get i'll give you four percent zamindar 2 may appoint another person zamindar 3 by saying that out of the four i get i'll give you two percent so this person may appoint another person by saying that i'll give you one person so this will lead to a chain of intermediaries so this is also a specific problem with respect to you know zamindari settlement or permanent settlement so chain of intermediaries now chain of intermediaries means now one thing simple simple thing is that this lead to exploitation because the last one in the chain is getting like one percent or 0.5 percent or 0.25 percent right so if you need to get more what you need to do he need to squeeze the peasant and you need to take more and more from the peasants but see if the state is asking you to collect 100 rupee how much state will get 91 how much zamindar will get nine now this is what asked by the state to collect now what if you collect 200 you are not supposed to collect okay it is actually illegal you cannot collect but zamindars will collect now do you think they will give the proper share to the state like 90 91 percent no they will give only 91 because if you if you give more you are revealing that you are doing illegal activity right so rest of the 109 belongs to the zamindars so they keep on exploiting the peasants so neither the state nor the peasant will benefit here it is the zamindars who only will benefit here okay so that's about uh, this consequence apart from that now general consequence if you see that you can write everywhere else also the general consequences are like the taxation is so high even though it is fixed on the basis of 1790 it is close to 60 percentage of the total produce that include inputs also so if you add the inputs in that you know it comes around 80 to 90 percentage the peasants have to pay as the tax and the peasants left out with nothing right so high rate of taxation is one point you can write high rate of taxation okay then you can also write uh, you know because of this uh, even if there is a crop failure there because of natural calamity or anything still you need to pay tax otherwise you lose the land so what the peasants will do sometimes they borrow money to pay tax and this have seen a, as a great opportunity by some sections who are they money lenders mahajans marwadis etc so those people started emerging into the rural area right so that led to emergence of money lenders and they lend at a very high interest rate so ultimately these people landed in debt so that lead to rural indebtedness so what i can write here is emergence of emergence of money lenders okay then that led to rural indebtedness okay now because of this what will happen they will lose the land ultimately either to the zamindars okay because they are not able to pay the tax so what will happen they become rural landless laborers they have no other choice now they are, they lost their land so they will become laborers so rural landless labor now this will result into what unemployment or i won't say unemployment because in case of agricultural land agricultural land the speciality is anybody can get employment there agriculture can occupy any agriculture can absorb any number of people right for example this piece of land only three people uh, is required here for example for uh, you know uh, making a produce of let's say one quintal but five people can also be accommodated in the land 
for example a piece of land a family is having five member the entire five member will work there even if 10 members there 10 members also work there so agriculture the speciality is that the agriculture can absorb any that's why the problem of uh, developing countries mainly is disguised unemployment even though agriculture is contributing 14 15 percent if you see the employment uh, this uh, 50 percentage of the employment right this is disguised unemployment the marginal productivity is actually zero over there i have discussed all these concepts in uh, you know our economy lectures so if you have missed out any of the videos i have already told you right this here you get all my economy videos i have done economy complete uh, around 300 lectures i have done on economy that in itself is enough for your complete economy preparation history i have done uh, quantitative aptitude i have done sociology i have done completely almost ethics i have done okay so all those are done and you can see that videos okay if you have any doubt you can get in touch with me so here rural landless labor that lead to uh, unemployment okay or disguised unemployment so the margin this a uh, new uh, see one quintal can be produced by those three people five people are added there is no increase in production so marginal product or the marginal productivity is zero that's why it is unemployment right these five people are actually considered as unemployed that's what disguised unemployment so you can write here unemployment that lead to poverty that lead to inequality everything whatever you feel like you can write here these are general in nature okay now after this so that's about permanent settlement now let's quickly do, discuss about a riot wari settlement okay a riot wari settlement so who introduced this this was actually introduced by thomas munro and read this was actually a question in prelims 2017 recent one thomas munro and read where it is introduced it was actually introduced in different parts first one was in eastern part okay this is in central and southern part so it was in madras now when i'm talking about madras madras is a huge area it comprises almost all south india entire tamil nadu parts of kerala parts of uh, andhra pradesh parts of karnataka so it's such a huge area almost entire south india is covered okay so madras and then uh, you know uh, this bombay again when we talk about bombay huge area including uh, you know gujarat maharashtra sindh all these areas will be covered also central provinces with capital nagpur now it was actually introduced in different phases starting from 1805 then in 1817 1818 so there is no need to remember the year in this case okay riot is actually a persian word its meaning is actually peasant okay so here uh, in this the speciality is that here there is no intermediary the, there is no zamindar state came into direct relation with the peasant so peasant and state now is in di direct relation through a official british official so the british official will collect the tax from the peasant and will pay it to the state so it is the responsibility of this person or he is actually the collector now okay to collect the money i hope you understood so ownership is with whom ownership is with the peasants okay so if he is not able to pay the tax he will lose the ownership the ownership is again till the time you pay the tax so do you think absentee landlordism will be here no chance right why because here there is no question of landlord landlord is actually the peasant only similarly chain of intermediaries is not possible because this person is not going to appoint another officer because that's his job right so those two problems are specific to a permanent settlement apart from that the other problems that we have discussed all these high rate of taxation emergence of money lenders rural indebtedness rural landless labors inequality poverty unemployment all these will be common okay now where it was implemented we have discussed when we have discussed who implemented we have discussed structure we have discussed what more yeah it was uh, in around 51 percentage of the british india okay so this much area is covered and this is actually the maximum area in terms of coverage of area so impact also we have discussed i think uh, we have completed this okay so ma money lenders mahajans marwadis they started coming to southern regions and deccan regions and when we discuss about deccan rights i'll talk about that the outsiders started coming to the regions and they started buying purchasing money by you know giving this money at a very high interest rates and ultimately the land belongs to those money lenders so that resulted into an entirely different socio economic situation in that deccan region that we will discuss in detail when we discuss about deccan rights okay so next one is Mahalwari settlement. Mahalwari settlement. So I've told you the first one is 19%, second is 51%, so 70 is over. So this will be in 30% of the 
British India where first was in eastern part second was in southern and central now what is left out the northern part is left out right so northern part means I'm talking about Punjab and western UP Punjab is a huge territory again the present day Pakistan's Lahore Himachal Pradesh all these areas are actually there okay so so Punjab and western up in 1830 by halt mckenzie halt mckenzie so land revenue was actually collected by mahal here mahal is a punjabi word its meaning is village okay so here it is the responsibility that it is a collective responsibility of the panchayat or the mahal to collect revenue and the person or the leader the local leader who is responsible for the collection of land revenue is known as lambardar or number that in different regions okay so here also the common problems are this high rate of taxation emergence of money lenders rural landless indebtedness rural landless labors all these are common problems but the first two absentee landlordism and chain of intermediaries are specific to zamindari settlement or permanent settlement okay so i hope you're done with the uh, land tenure system let's skip uh, john short john short period is 1793 to 1798 john sure he is actually important only for you know permanent settlement when we discuss about permanent settlement i have already discussed this name he was a deputy along with lord cornwallis now he became the governor general nothing significant from exam point of view so i skip this person because our discussion is for exam nothing else okay nothing less nothing more i'm not going to leave anything for chances that's for sure whatever is important we are covering but you are not going to expect any question from this person apart from permanent settlement Okay, so next is uh, Lord Wellesley. Okay, Lord Wellesley, that is 1798 to 1805. So, when we discuss about Lord Wellesley, what is important? It is that controversial policy which is important. What is a controversial policy? Subsidiary alliance. So, first thing that you need to know is what is subsidiary alliance? It is actually a military help. For example, if a king is facing a problem, let's say this is country kingdom A and he is facing some external threat he will ask some military help so some other king will offer military help by giving the army and protect the border so this is was uh, this is what actually subsidiary alliance it's a military help who introduced this or who's the pioneer of this if this is a question it's not wellesley it is a french governor duplex when he rented his army to hyderabad way back in 1740s so duplex introduced this policy what wellesley did wellesley made some changes and he used it extensively to expand his you know army across india how he did this he actually uh, signed this treaty with many local rulers he either signed it voluntarily uh, or forcefully so he forced some rulers to sign this or some rulers who's facing the genuine threat they sign voluntarily also so you see let's suppose this is india across this different kingdoms are there so he's signing this treaty and keeping army here 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 now what is the benefit for wellesley or british this entire expense of this army will be taken care by the local ruler who is signing the treaty. So without having any burden on their exchequer, they are able to maintain a huge army across India. And if there is any problem in this area, you can simply mobilize this army and you can solve the issue. Okay, so across India, they were pan India, they, have, they were able to... Uh, maintain a huge army without spending anything from their exchequer so that's how beautifully he crafted this policy or he made changes what are the changes he made okay let me tell you there are there are four four five elements that can be asked in prelims as well as if the question is asked in mains also you need to write firstly uh, if you are signing this treaty the local ruler who's signing the treaty he cannot employ any foreigner other than english in their army so he actually prevented entry of any other foreigner other than english no french no portuguese now can enter into that particular kingdom okay so no foreigner other than english can be a part of their army secondly uh, if a country or the, if a ruler is signing the treaty in case of any war policy or peace policy or in any war treaty or peace treaty they have to inform it firstly to the british before signing it even though they are using this word inform it is actually strategically used effectively you need to get the permission from the british so don't you think it is surrendering your sovereignty when you are getting permission from british to sign a treaty with some other ruler yes and that's the reason why 
if you see 1799 there is fourth anglo mysore war why this war was actually fought anglo mysore war this war was actually fought by tipu because he understood he was forced to sign this treaty but he was not interested why because you signing the treaty means you're surrendering the sovereignty and tipu was not interested in this in fact he preferred to fight and he died in the battle and after the death of tipu in 1799 mysore signed this treaty so if you see mains you can get this question and this question was asked also before uh, the statement will be given his in history the the death of Tipu is understood in history or historians as an honorable death than a dishonorable pact. Discuss, comment, critically analyze. All these are different answers but the content remain the same. So Tipu's death is an honorable death than a dishonorable pact. Today only I have uh, I was evaluating a test series. I have, I have evaluated around seven papers. Minimum seven papers I have evaluated. So none of the seven papers all are good students okay they have written very well but none of them are actually writing the correct answer for this you may think that this is very easy question it is from the fourth anglo mysore war tipu's death i have seen people are writing about fourth anglo mysore war the reasons for the war they are even talking about all the other wars okay and uh, the, how they fought how was the organization everything but that's not the question the question is tipu's death it's an honorable death than a dishonorable pact. What is that pact that is talking about in the question? It is a subsidiary alliance. And I have never seen people writing a single word on subsidiary alliance. So do you think you will get any mark if you are doing that? No. The question is very specific. It is related to subsidiary alliance. It's related to nothing else. So without writing, what you need to write here? You need to write what is subsidiary alliance? What are the conditions? And what conditions uh, uh, motivated Tipu not to sign the treaty? Especially the second one because you are surrendering the sovereignty. And and instead he preferred to fight against the English and he died in that battle so it is considered as honorable death than signing this dishonorable pact so that's about the question and that's what you need to answer and that's how you need to answer no no need to write about any other wars no need to write about how he fought the war what all the equipments that he used who all are his army members no point in writing all those things okay so hardly you get to write uh, 200 words and subsidiary lens is what you need to write over there so that's the second point third point uh, if you sign this treaty an english resident had to be kept in the capital of that local state who's signing the treaty and the entire expenditure of that english resident had to be taken care of by the local king including his food cloth expenditure you know the guards soldiers every expenditure has to be taken care of by the local king so these are three conditions if you sign this treaty you cannot employ any foreigner other than british secondly in case of war treaty peace treaty you have to inform it firstly to the british thirdly an english resident had to be stationed in the capital of that local state who's signing the treaty and the entire expenditure including the guards soldiers the food cloth etc has to be taken care by the local king i'm not making you to write and i'm not writing here also i hope you understood in return britishers promised that they will not interfere in the internal matters of the state which they never did they hardly did they always interfere secondly they promise that they will protect the local ruler or the local king local kingdom from any external threat in fact the britishers became the threat for them and for example 1803 sindh is a state which signed this treaty but 1843 exactly after 40 years sindh was annexed by british and there was a very famous statement by Charles Napier who was the person who is responsible for the annexation of Sindh. We don't have any right to annex Sindh and still we do it and what a piece of rascality it is. He wrote a letter to the Governor General like this. Okay, uh, we will discuss that in detail when we discuss about Ellen Boro and during that time we will discuss. But still, see when you are signing the treaty you have to protect, you are obliged to protect that state, Sindh. And you send the sign the subsidiary lands and you are annexing. So it is surely and clearly a piece of rascality. Okay. So I hope you understood that's about subsidiary lands. If the question is about who is the pioneer or, or whose brainchild or who introduced it is French governor duplex. But Wellesley made modifications and Wellesley used it to expand his army across India without spending anything from their exchequer. So that's how beautifully he crafted or he modified or he changed or he used this particular policy. Okay, so I hope you understood this. Now we also need to see the states which signed the treaty. You don't want to know all the states, at least the few states, initial states, because uh, they can ask you, uh, since initial states they can ask you, they can also ask you to arrange in a chronological order or match the following. So 1798 uh, Hyderabad, Hyderabad. 1799 i've told you already mysore 
so you please note down this point uh, mysore joined after the death of tipu after the death of tipu after the fourth anglo mysore war okay and you also note down that statement uh, which i have told you it is an honorable death than a dishonorable pact so you need to connect it with this pact i'm telling you this again and again so that it will be printed in your mind don't write any other words don't write any other reasons don't write his strategies or anything it's all about the pact so you need to talk about this particular uh, pact okay subsidiary lines so 1801 avad and you will see in 1856 avad also will be annexed just by a lame reason that is misgovernance and that is also one of the reason for 1857 revolt we'll talk about that uh, 1802 peshwa and avad was one of the prosperous state governed properly nawab wajid ali shah and even the people were also not uh, able to digest that annexation so we will discuss that in detail don't worry about that okay so history your history will be completely covered not only history economy and all subjects will be covered properly so 1803 uh, 1803 synth okay so these uh, first five states that's what you need to know now 1800 there is one more important point that we need to discuss is fort william college was established by wellesley fort william college constructed on the bank of river hugli okay so fort william college so it was important for keeping one of the railway zones of india and it was from here actually britishers ruling india till 1911 and 1911 delhi darbar it was shifted to delhi the capital was shifted to delhi so till 1911 it was from here they ruled india okay so it was actually set up to train the newly recruited civil servants uh, about uh, you know india's customs culture etc okay so so it was actually established to train the newly recruited civil servants in which languages hindi urdu etc like when you are getting selected you will have training in labasna svp npa national police academy etc right so exactly the same kind of training but this college didn't had it didn't uh, went well there was a controversy there was issues between board of control uh, court of directors and the company then it was shut down it was closed in 1802 1802 the college was closed and the first and only principal of this college was john gilchrist okay so that's it these are the most important points that you need to remember so we will stop the session we will continue this in the next session at least the important areas i will cover in the youtube videos but if you still need any live classes i have live classes regular classes are available okay uh, if you need any help related to civil services you can get in touch with me i have already given my number here right so this is my number this is my instagram id or uh, telegram channel you get everything in telegram channel simply you subscribe or join the telegram channel you get everything over there okay around 300 plus videos are there that in itself is enough to cover your core subjects or except geography i am covering everything okay so see you guys thank you